All right. Uh, the meeting is starting to be recorded. Um, welcome, everyone, to the, the panel we have at SC21 on bioinformatics, HPC, and AI. Uh, we're really looking at the con convergence perspectives and applications in biomedical computing. Just a moment. Um, the panel's been organized. We've got a fantastic panel for today. The panel itself is going to be covering several topics as soon as we get the uh, things shifted. Not sure what's going on. There we go. So today's panel is going to be covering genomics. Um, it's going to be covering a lot of other aspects of bioinformatics, as we know, and historically, um, genomics has really dominated bioinformatics for the past decade, but yet there's new innovations coming in bioinformatics. Even as there's new applications for the genomics, there's, it's just an evolving field. Uh, what we have today is a wonderful panel that's going to help us tease through some of these issues and look at the different perspectives that we have. Uh, new technologies are coming online. They enable new observations at growing numbers of scales and increasing volumes of information. So it creates a tremendous opportunity for new insights and new in innovation. Uh, we're finding HPC and AI are playing a key role uh, as the breadth and depth of bioinformatics continues to evolve, uh, creating some opportunities for new exciting biomedical applications. Uh, today's panel uh, will really explore this. We have experts from various pers uh, perspectives. It's going to be a fantastic panel. Uh, the panelists that we have today, we have Patricia Kovach from Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, uh, Marty Head from Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Aaron Kroge from Nemours Alfred uh, I. DuPont Hospital for Children, Sean Davis from the University of Colorado, uh, David Jaffrey from MD Anderson Cancer Center, and Jill Barnold Sloan from the National Cancer Institute. I had the uh, I'm blessed to have the opportunity to be the moderator for this panel, and uh, you know, shortly we'll be hearing from these experts. Uh, a few quick logistics: uh, if you're going to be asking questions, uh, make sure you ac access the sc21.hub.me. Uh, we'll use the slido for that. We'll be looking at those and be able to reflect those into the discussion. The uh, floor of the panel that we've set up is going to have a series of presentations by these experts sharing some perspectives, their introductions, a little bit more about them, various things of that nature. And then we'll spend the balance of the panel on questions and discussion topics. Uh, we're really looking for your, your input as well in that particular aspect. In the order of our panelists, we're going to start off with Jill in, in a moment. We'll have Sean Davis, uh, Patricia Kovach, Marty Head, Aaron Kroge, and David Jaffrey as we go forward. Uh, I think with that, Jill, are you all, all set? Yes, I am. All Go right. ahead and so I think we'll share have, my screen. I think that's what we need to do. Oh, you have to unshare first, Eric. All right, I have to stop share. There we go. Sorry, it's not going to slideshow. Um, one second. I'm so sorry, everyone. It's completely frozen. Um, give me one sec. Jill, if we, if we need to, we can potentially reorder the presentations a bit. I think I'm okay. Okay. All right. There we go. There we go. All right, great. Um, thank you so much to uh, Dr. Stahlberg and the organizers of ST21 for having me talk to you today. Uh, the focus of my talk today is going to be on the NCI Cancer Research Data Commons and how we're gonna be leveraging, um, and state, these data are already leveraged for uh, lots of different advanced computing, really accelerating cancer research. So talk to you a little bit about the history, vision, and capabilities um, with the overarching goal of moving towards a full cancer data ecosystem. 
a little bit about how we're thinking about how CRDC can help enable um, AI and machine learning work. And also just a few thoughts on system and data requirements for AI and ML work. So the overarching vision for the Cancer Research Data Commons is really to accelerate cancer research through integrative analyses of aggregate multimodal data, where we would be promoting fair principles of data stewardship, enabling the research community to broadly share diverse research data, providing easy and secure access to those data, helping different NCI-supported data coordinating centers sustain and broadly share their data, and facilitate generation of novel and innovative analytical tools. Uh, a lot of the Cancer Research Data Commons really started from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Um, these are just showing you some statistics related to the Cancer Genome Atlas, but the Cancer Genome Atlas is really a game changer for us understanding that um, each of the specific cancer diagnoses were in fact many, many different subtypes of, of that cancer. And it's important to know that so that we can use targeted therapies to really help patients the best we can. A conceptual view of the Cancer Research Data Commons shows you in the middle here in the top, the different portals that are available. So the Integrative Canine Data Commons, Imaging Data Commons, Genomic Data Commons, Proteomic Data Commons, these are all currently available. And some that are coming soon are the Human Tumor Atlas Network, the Apollo Network, which is a unique collaboration between the NCI, Department of Defense, and Veterans Administration, and the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative. And we provide three different cloud resources, which I'll tell you a little bit about, to access those data and compute with those data. And many other services are also available for connecting data across these portals and also um, harmonizing the data elements across the portals. And soon we will have a data coordinating center which will allow for ingestion of data. In addition, we are planning a clinical trials data commons where some of the NCI funded clinical trials data will also be available. So really what this is about is about putting together a full uh, national cancer data ecosystem where we're leveraging the infrastructure repositories, analytics, and common vocabulary structure to connect data at all levels for maximal discovery for cancer. And um, the Center for Biomedical Informatics and IT at the NCI, where, where I'm a part of, um, helps to facilitate much of this in close collaboration with the NCI Office of Data Sharing and all of our federal stakeholders across the NCI. The cloud resources are unique um, in that they allow easy access to these very large cancer data sets, petabytes and petabytes of data without the need to download. You have access to individual workspaces, analytical tools and pipelines, and you can also bring in your own data and tools. Um, so it really allows data access, compute access and security. And I'll tell you a little bit about those three cloud resources right now. So the first is FireCloud, um, and it's really great for running production pipelines. That's one of its major strengths. And here's just a screenshot of what it looks like. Um, the second is the Cancer Genomics Cloud by Seven Bridges, and it's really great for um, more of a non-technical user interface and has some really great visual displays, which I show you some examples here. And the third is through the Institute for Systems Biology, and they use Google BigQuery, so it's really great for command line folks and, and folks who are interested in using BigQuery. In addition, they've brought in two other big databases, very important databases, um, into the, the ISB cloud resource, one on P53, um, which is sort of known as the guardian of the genome. Uh, for cancer and also on the Middleman da database for chromosomal aberrations uh, and gene fusions in cancer. And um, you can actually get credits to support your research using these cloud resources. Um, you, you'll automatically be granted $300 in credits, but you can also submit collaborative project requests where you can get up to $10,000 in credits. Here are just a couple interesting scientific use cases just to show you the depth and breadth um, of, of what can be done within these, these cloud resources. Um, so one big example for broad, 
road fire cloud, sorry, is uh, the immune cell atlas profiling of transcriptomes of over 1.7 million single cells um, from a variety of immune related tissues um, across over 30 plus donors. And it's been used in the Human Tumor Atlas Project or HTAN, uh, Human Tumor Atlas Project, which is part of, which led to, sorry, the Human Tumor Atlas Network. For the ISB resource, um, they have used this resource to publish a lot of pan cancer atlas projects. And this is taking all of the data across all of TCGA, the over 30 or so cancers included in TCGA, doing some really heavy computing analysis and, and some novel discoveries there. And one example from Seven Bridges is the um, patient-derived xenograph network data coordinating center, um, where they they've already had many many high-impact publications and are providing access to um, these this model repository, which is so important for um, preclinical work in cancer. The imaging data commons is just shows you a, a, a very um, high-level schematic of the the AI workflow and how it could be used. There's a data retrieval um, using Google Cloud Storage and BigQuery, data visualization. There's some examples here. Um, and you can go to the, the imaging data comments and look at the viewer. And then um, it has cloud compute set up um, through Google and will allow you to do your compute there without having to download those massive imaging data sets. So it can really play a central role in imaging AI development by providing um, access to reproducible AI pipelines in the cloud, um, access to massive data sets, which is what these AI algorithms really feed off of. And also there are several use cases already there that have been developed by collaborators to highlight these possibilities. Um, here's one such example um, where, uh, and I wanna thank Drs. Conte and Eric, Erickson from Mayo Clinic for providing us this, this, with this, where they were able to actually um, use this to predict IDH mutation status in gliomas um, via a deep learning and radiomics pipeline using the imaging data commons and some of the data that's available there, um, especially linked to the cancer genome atlas studies for lower grade gliomas and glioblastomas. And why is this important? IDH mutation is a critical hallmark mutational feature for gliomas and very important for diagnosis and prognosis. In addition, we, we do extensive work. This is with Dr. Greenspan and also Dr. Stauberg in collaboration with the Department of Energy. Um, it started out as three pilot projects. You can see that two of the pilots are still going on, um, RAS biology and one uh, in collaboration with, with the Surveillance Epidemiology and, and Results Program. And there's a new pilot that just started called Improve Innovative methodologies and new data for predictive oncology model evaluation. And why is this important? Because it's all about the predictions. Um, and so we're very excited to see where this goes and continues to go. And there's lots of AI and machine learning applications that are being um, used here in, in these um, pilot studies through this DOE collaboration. So I, I think it's important to think about the fact that um, for, for AI and machine learning to really be broadly used and broadly available, we need to think about systems that have open architecture um, and application programming interface that allows for easy system interaction, clear and thorough documentation, and a clear understanding of how the system can be used and how it can be leveraged, given that the AI and machine learning approaches are being applied all across the board, especially in cancer, but also in many other human diseases and many other areas that are not um, necessarily in human disease. And a really important component is the data that we're designing the studies properly. We have sufficient sample size, that any identifiers are protected, that we're sharing these data sets in it by applying the FAIR principles, and that there's quality control and formatting control. Um, one of the things that's so important about, especially validation of the AI and machine learning algorithms is having the data readily available um, to be able to do that validation. So I'd like to thank my colleagues at CBET and, and Eric Starberg, of course, at FNL and the Erickson Lab for providing us that example from Mayo. And I invite you to take a, a look at 
the Cancer Research Data Commons website at datacommons.cancer.gov. And you can go up here on the top menu under repositories, and you can read and access all the specific repositories that I just outlined for you that are part of the Cancer Research Data Commons. And that's it. All right, thank you, Jill. Uh, great presentation. Uh, Sean, are you ready to roll? Okay. Yep. All right. Everyone have a slide have the slides in front of them? It looks good in this room. All right. Um, so uh, thanks, Eric, and the organizing committee. Uh, this is this is gonna be really fun. Um, Jill, that was a great talk, by the way, and I'm a big uh, fan and user of uh, those resources, uh, which we'll touch, touch on a bit here. Um, uh, so I, I was at NCI. Oops. Uh, I was at NCI until very recently, um, and it recently moved on to the University of Colorado. Here's a little bit about me. Um, I have a you know a little bit of an unusual training background, but uh, most of us probably do in this space. So um, I wanted to talk at a higher level um, than what Jill was talking about. Um, I, I have a role here at in the University of Colorado um, where uh, I'm thinking not just about individual science projects, but also about how um, the institution um, becomes a, a, a more mature data organization. Um, and challenges, I'm gonna list them here. These are um, uh, for uh, discussion purposes later, but um, Access and reuse, when you start talking about artificial intelligence and ML uh, machine learning um, for healthcare purposes, uh, and in particular bioinformatics uh, uh, applications, is a real challenge. The data are large, um, they're very disparate, and particularly if you want to marry them to uh, electronic health records, there's a lot of discovery uh, converting data to be much more fit for use, uh, data harmonization. And, uh, and, and data governance is something that we, we haven't had to think a lot about in genomics um, and in bioinformatics because by and large our, our data um, come to us anonymized. So these, uh, these are challenges, but they also represent opportunities I'll talk about in a bit. Um, you know, uh, when you think about building a data mature organization, just like with any other uh, aspect of maturing an organization, knowledge and knowledge management becomes really important. So um, community, how do you build community as a practice around um, artificial intelligence, machine learning um, that crosses into um, these uh, uh, bioinformatics uh, fields or applications that really haven't um, necessarily been at the forefront of AI and ML? Um, uh, how, how do you uh, manage knowledge uh, and how do you come up with best practices? Um, and I'll come back to that in a bit. Um, a workforce is um, a real challenge as well. Um, I'd say, it, you know, compared to when I started in bioinformatics uh, 18, 19 years ago, bioinformaticians, um, it, finding well-trained and experienced bioinformaticians is, is uh, much, um, I won't say easier, but, um, but it's a different challenge than it used to be. Um, and the same thing with AI and ML. Um, there are a lot of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning practitioners and developers, um, scientists, research scientists, um, but those two workforces um, have not converged yet. And uh, there, that, that be, remains a challenge to build a workforce that uh, has all these capabilities. Um, compute resources. Uh, this is an HPC uh, conference. And um, compute resources from the perspective of um, genomics uh, compute resources, um, those are uh, typically uh, well-shared. Uh, many of us enjoy access to um, uh, well-managed uh, high-performance computing resources. But uh, as uh, investment for uh, uh, artificial intelligence applications, in particular deep learning applications, um, involves uh, much more significant capital costs um, and a much smaller um, set of consumers, um, sharing hardware um, and uh, sharing those resources becomes one more important and two harder. Um, so it's something to, that uh, we're struggling with now at, at uh, University of Colorado. 
And finally, um, adopting uh, new paradigms. Uh, so if we think about artificial intelligence and machine learning as something that's not uh, always going to be done at the open source command line um, on uh, commodity hardware, uh, but has to include uh, serverless computing, uh, compute services, uh, um, that is software as a service, data as a service, APIs, as, as Jill was mentioning, and um, some very unfamiliar tech stacks. Um, uh, these are all things that um, you know come back to knowledge management in, in many cases. Opportunities. Um, just over the last few years, um, uh, last maybe two years even, um, the interest in funding uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, in uh, biomedical fields and in particular bioinformatics has it, it increased significantly. Um, government funders, um, executive leaders, uh, leaders, and uh, their um, institutional funds and finally philanthropy all have really high levels of interest in uh, AI and ML around um, genomics and precision medicine. Um, that has to be balanced, of course, with expectations and that's another challenge. Um, uh, we ha we uh, uh, have an opportunity here to leverage some really, really spectacular work um, being done in other fields. Um, uh, around uh, artificial intelligence, in particular, um, uh, uh, trained models, uh, and uh, uh, we don't have to uh, invent these things from from scratch. And we can leverage um, uh, uh, transfer learning approaches, for example, um, to uh, deal with some of our small sample size issues. Interdisciplinary training uh, is uh, always a, a challenge. Um, but it's an opportunity here as well because we can bring in people who aren't typically involved in uh, training our next generation biomedical uh, data scientists um, from industry or, or um, uh, other fields. Um, and data integration um, is, while it is a challenge for all of us, um, if we do it right in our organizations um, and as a nation really, um, we can uh, 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 pretty quickly accelerate uh, a lot of the science that we're doing because we're making data fit for purpose. Um, learning healthcare systems and real world data are, are probably a few years off um, as a general uh, approach um, to uh, applying these things in uh, applying artificial intelligence and machine learning in clinical settings. But uh, if we get, get the research purposes uh, and research data integration right, uh, it'll make it a lot easier to do that when we come to that point. Um, one of the hats I wear is to uh, uh, work with the Bioconductor Project. I've been lucky enough for the last 15 years to work with uh, um, in, in a, uh, a distributed faculty um, that helps to uh, guide this project that now uh, has resulted in about 2,000 independent software packages. Um, uh, probably at this point, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of development hours um, and all uh, for a relatively small cost. And uh, uh, one of my uh, real passions is to take uh, publicly available data or just uh, generally available data and make it more um, fit for reuse um, and uh, uh, develop uh, approaches for uh, reproducible computational research um, through software. So the Genomic Data Commons package interfaces directly with uh, the same uh, uh, cloud infrastructure that uh, Jill was talking about. Um, Refined Bio is uh, by, uh, it was developed by uh, one of my uh, colleagues here in, in Colorado and the cancer data, Childhood Cancer Data Science Lab. Um, Refined Bio is a, a harmonized uh, collection of um, right now about 1.5 million uh, transcriptomic data sets uh, that are easily accessible um, and uh, have, like I said, have been harmonized both from a metadata perspective and a data perspective. And we're using that. Um, to develop uh, new techniques for indexing um, into uh, uh, these publicly available data resources and uh, building, um, uh, really formalizing the concept of a knowledge graph that includes uh, quantitative uh, values that, that is basically um, latent variables describing the actual um, uh, data resources, not just the metadata associated with them. Uh, we, I'm beginning to, the, uh, the metadata themselves for um, genomics and for bioinformatics are so big um, that we have to begin to think of those as um, data resources themselves. And one might think, oh, that sounds pretty trivial, but um, 
uh, try mining um, NCBI for all the possible uh, genomic data, you'll find that you end up crawling um, APIs that um, are, are sometimes challenging for bulk uh, use. So we we, um, we ingest those data and then make them available in, in very um, easy to use uh, computable formats. And then finally, I mentioned uh, data science or mentioned uh, training. Uh, one of the things that I've done over the last uh, two or three years is develop a, a training platform um, for hands-on computational research. This uh, aligned perfectly, um, fortunately or unfortunately, with COVID. Um, this is a, a, an online cloud-based uh, um, uh, training platform that allows um, anyone who wants to do computational training to um, uh, containerize um, their entire um, compute uh, environment and then make that available with a with a click. Uh, so no more uh, needing to install um, software uh, version issues uh, or network um, bandwidth issues. This is all happening in the cloud and, in, and can be done in real time. We've taught about 7,000 of these workshops um, with up to 600 participants simultaneously. And then um, I'm not going to read through these, but uh, we really do need to focus on equity and fairness. So we can we can often focus on the technical uh, pieces, but um, uh, it, it's so easy um, to uh, train our models um, that uh, accentuate um, the uh, biases that we build into our data and into um, our our, um, our assumptions about how the world works. So uh, a focus on equity and fairness is really really important. Um, in the essence, or in the uh, uh, for time, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, um, and I look forward to the conversation. All right, thank you, Sean. Our next presenter is going to be Patricia. Uh, we're going to do that remotely, so just give me a moment while we get this. Or excuse me, uh, recorded. So just give me a moment while we get this rolling. See the Chrome. See that. See how that rolls. Seem like we're getting any sound. Monk? I suppose we're supposed to keep our volume off. Please bear with us while we figure this out. Hello, I'm Patricia Kovach, the Dean for Scientific Computing and Data at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers and I'd like to thank you all for being here to hear my uh, presentation. Uh, just a quick uh, slide about me. I've been at Sinai since uh, 2011. Um, I've worked in high performance computing for over 30 years. 
Um, just a little bit about the Mount Sinai Health System. We're about a $8 billion a year um, healthcare organization. We have a medical school and, and have graduate uh, degrees. And then also we're a large hospital system. We have over 8 million patients. Uh, our vision for AI, we want to promote a culture of understanding of the benefits, risks, and approaches for AI. Uh, through education and training, all through our students up to senior leadership. Um, we want to use AI to facilitate translation and improve patient outcomes within a framework of ethics. And of course, we want to leverage the computational and data infrastructure investments and resources that we have. Um, and we've worked, uh, like many academic medical centers, we've been working uh, uh, to transform care delivery, care delivery uh, through a growing portfolio of projects. Um, we have about 30 initiatives that we've been working on in many different areas that you can see on this slide across our six hospitals. And we've moved a lot of these um, AI uh, uh, predictive analytics uh, to production. Uh, one example of one of these projects is this COVID-360 real-time dashboard. Um, I mean, uh, in New York City, we were at the center, uh, the epicenter of the uh, the U.S. outbreak outbreak for COVID, and so of course we needed a way to help physicians uh, to help physicians be able to help predict what may happen to some of the patients, and it you know, so that we could improve their care. Um, and so we did a retrospective analysis on these uh, using the data that we had and looking at the outcomes that we had. Um, and we came up with this uh, tool that has been used for over 50,000 times over the past year. Um, it just looks at individual patients, but it was, but it gives uh, physicians some guidance on uh, what we predict, what this tool predicts will happen. Um, another example was we did uh, this automatic, uh, we did some AI uh, diagnosis of COVID using imaging. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, at various times over the past year, you know, PCR tests have been difficult to get. And so we worked on getting these images to get, sorry, we worked on developing a model that had an area under the curve of 0.92 um, that was consistent with what a senior thoracic uh, cardiologist radiologist uh, would have for um, diagnosing COVID. So we were doing, sorry, we were doing this based on CT scans. And you can read more about it in the paper. Um, and of course, bringing together all of these data sets, um, it, you know, in order to do these kinds of analyses and to make it to have these kinds of insights, um, of course, you have to bring together a lot of these different data sets, whether, you know, imaging data, genomic data, um, of course, electronic health record data, um, and so that we can uh, run these big data analyses. So um, we have different groups at Sinai that are uh, working together to help make this a uh, reality. And so one of the ways in which we're doing this, of course, uh, a lot of these um, analyses require high performance computing. And so we have about a two petaflop uh, size machine, largely of Intel cores, and we have some GPUs as well, as well. And we have this integrated with some imaging data with our biobank data. Our biobank data has about 50,000 patients in it. We've also integrated this. Our data arc is our local data commons. It has some national data sets or international data sets in it um, from UK biobank. Um, and parts of TCGA and other data sets, but we also have some local data in there, like for instance, our COVID data sets that, uh, that, that are, sorry, that come from Epic Caboodle and their electronic health record data sets. And, um, you know, early in the pandemic, there were lots of folks that were asking us for very similar data sets. So we started putting together some de-identified data sets that everyone could use. Uh, or everyone at Sinai could use. And, um, you know, we started with a small number of elements, but over time it's up to 400 elements uh, in this data set. And we've had over 7,000 downloads um, uh, since April of last year. And so these are the kinds of data sets that are available, the genomic data, imaging data, EHR data. Um, 
And speaking of VHR data, the, the MSDW2 uh, on here is our Mount Sinai data warehouse. So as you can see, we get data directly from Epic Caboodle, and it's actually sitting on our supercomputer. So it helps uh, for researchers to be able to do these kinds of big data analyses, to have all this data in one place. Um, here's some more details about our computing infrastructure, um, and I'll leave this as a lesson for the reader, um, uh, as there's limited time. Uh, and of course, uh, we've been working with other uh, national uh, corporate partners to help us develop the best AI um, analyses that we can, and um, so these are some of the partners we've been working with. Uh, so, of course, as I mentioned in the beginning, we want to, of course, all the work that we want to do, it has to be within this ethics framework. Um, and so we've gotten a group of folks together. Uh, we, we've got a, sorry, we've gotten a bunch of groups of folks together to help kind of uh, refine this more. Um, and so we've decided actually on three separate work groups, one to look at broad principles of AI ethics for our staff, patients, and community. Um, one is to look at the ethical use of internally developed AI tools, and one for externally developed AI tools. And you can see, you know, some of this is, you know, trying to tease out the biases in the data. I mean, externally developed tools, we have little to no visibility into the factors, or sometimes, you know, what data sets were even used. And so, you know, how do we know which tools to deploy when and where and, uh, you know, how much should we disclose to our patients about, you know, how we're using their data or how we're using these other tools and models that we have. So here's some more specific questions. Um, you know, you know how, how do we know if the AI we're using is beneficial? You know, all of these uh, questions, you know, um, you know, how, how, you know, how are we going to validate, uh, you know, how do we know when the, there's enough validation? Um, you know, do we need a nutrition label on what we're, so we can show it to our clinicians and our patients so they know? Um, uh, so these are some of the questions that we and, and probably a lot of uh, institutions are asking. Um, and uh, obviously important to us um, being able to use all of these tools effectively. Um, obviously, AI is going to have a precedented, unprecedented uh, role in clinical care. Um, and so uh, working together to help figure out, to help think through some of these different issues is obviously very important. Um, I also want to put a plug in that we have a lot of open physicians. Uh, so uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to me directly or to look at our careers website uh, to, to find these positions. So um, thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. All right, thank you, Patricia. Uh, our next presenter is going to be, be Marty Head, and I, I just want to take a moment to remind everyone, if you have questions, I see some of you are doing that, put them into the Slido, we're basically capturing those, and we'll use those to feed into the discussion after the presentations ha have completed. Uh, so Marty, if you're all set, uh, we'll let you roll. I'm all set, and I actually don't have any slides to share today. I thought instead I would talk extemporaneously, which allows me to respond to some of the things I knew I would be hearing from this amazing panel that you've put together, Eric. Um, and so just a brief introduction to myself. I'm Marty Head. I'm the director of the Joint Institute for Biological Sciences, a joint institute between Oak Ridge National Laboratory and the University of Tennessee System. And I'm also the director of computational biomedical initiatives at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, perhaps more relevant to our discussion today, before I came to Oak Ridge, I spent 20 years in R&D at GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceuticals. And while I was there, I was for more than a decade uh, the leader of the computational chemistry team in the U.S. Um, I then led, uh, was participant in and led collaborations with IBM, with Palantir, with others around um, building a, a data 
analytics capability and ecosystem within GlaxoSmithKline and ended my career there uh, building and then leading a, a data analytics team within the research, the early discovery um, part of the organization. And so when Eric first asked me to be part of this panel, my initial response was, you're talking to me about bioinformatics? I'm a computational chemist by training. And so what I actually think about and have been trained to think about is atoms inside of molecules and the interactions between different molecules, including uh, metabolites, proteins, small molecules and the like. And in the, the world of research that I've done, wanting to understand how these interactions lead to the emergent properties that are the biological systems that are all of us. Um, how do these processes lead to the emergent properties of health or disease, um, but all driven by interactions of molecules with each other. And so it didn't seem natural to me to think about um, bioinformatics as a topic where I would have much of value to offer. And so it's been really exciting to, to me so far to hear the first set of speakers, and I look forward to hearing from Aaron and, and David as well, because it's clear that Eric has put together a continuum that spans a set of techniques. And that's the way I do think we need to think about how artificial intelligence fits into having an impact on human health for the good. Um, and so we really need to think about cutting across scales. So looking at the kinds of systems that Jill is talking about at the NCI that, that start at genomics, but involve translational data and um, imaging data and all sorts of other data. Um, hearing about the exciting systems that Patricia is building at Mount Sinai that go all the way from clinical health records and what's going on with the patient down to that genomic level. How do we integrate those data across those scale? And how do we understand where are the best, the places where artificial intelligence specifically should fit into that spectrum? My biased opinion, which Eric has probably heard more times than he cares to, is that there's no one tool that's going to move us further down the road. Instead, we have to understand how can artificial intelligence, the new computing paradigms, the new algorithms, the new infrastructural capabilities, how do those integrate with more mechanistic models, systems level models, with experiment as a model system? How does that integrate together to get a holistic understanding of what it means to be a healthy individual and how we can intervene with those in those systems for a difference? Um, I will say that one of the exciting things that several have alluded to as well, Sean and others, is around one of the biggest changes that I think we're seeing in the world is actually a cultural change amongst us as scientists as far as where we're going and how we are using this. Um, when I first started working in data systems at GSK, it was very much a conversation of how do I move beyond this picture of the data is mine and I must protect it and I must put context around it and seeing real progress on a move towards data being open and putting that metadata and that context on it so that it can be used and integrated in the ways that we're talking about. That cultural change has been really exciting for so many of us to see. We're seeing a greater data savvy a greater tech savvy. Um, uh, you saw Patricia's comments about these programs that enable training of people in AI awareness. This concept that the experimentalists have savvy in data and the computational scientists develop savvy in the biological and chemical processes that matter and that we learn how to communicate with each other across all of those things. And finally, that growing awareness of the ethical importance of what we're doing. The 
ethics, be applying ethics from the very beginning to what are the data that we collect? Why are we collecting that data? How do we organize that and add information around it? And how do we ensure that both the generation and the application of AI and ML models are done in as ethical a way as possible? It's an exciting time to be in this field. It's an exciting time to think about where does AI fit into bioinformatics as the topic of this um, to, um, session it goes, but also where does AI fit into the modeling of interactions of small molecules with protein in the modeling of the integration of all of the biological processes to understand the functioning physiology. And how does that translate even further down the line to populations of patients within the hospitals and the care networks that, that were, um, deal with them? And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the, the last two talks to give us time for discussion in the last hour as those questions are coming in. Okay. Thank Hi. you, Marty. Thank you, Marty. Hi, everyone. It feels great to be um, here in person today, and thank you as well for the organizers. My name is Erin Crouchy. I'm the Director of Medical Bioinformatics and the Director of our Pediatric Genomics Laboratory at Nemours um, Children's Hospital. It's a nonprofit children's hospital located in Wilmington, Delaware. Today, I'm going to actually focus on bioinformatics and pe um, pediatric medicine and give um, more um, clinical case studies and reports today. So our area of focus on my team at Nemours is really centered around the learning healthcare data cycle. Um, this is really focused on data structures and common data models, which we heard about from Jill, and I'm not going to be focusing on that today, but just to say that common data models, data standardization, harmonization is essential to do any of this type of work. Um, I am going to focus on some data analysis and specifically within patient populations within Delaware. And specifically, I'm going to present two case studies. One is focused on improving quality outcomes, and the other one is about predictive medicine. Um, for those of you who are new or not familiar with the learning um, healthcare data cycle, it's really about at the practice or at the bedside. So you have your patient-provider interaction, from there data is generated, that data is then translated into knowledge, and that knowledge is applied back at the bedside. And really we want to impact this cycle, um, especially since we are a pediatric hospital and that is our major focus. So I'm going to highlight a first case study and just talk about how we use bioinformatics and genomics computational infrastructure to um, handle this particular um, uh, case population. So I'm going to focus on a high-risk population, so there's a direct clinical impact or need, and I can't stress the importance of the relevance of this enough in the medical field. Uh, we needed a cost-effective genomic diagnostic assay, um, both cost-effective in sequencing and also in data analysis and computational costs. Sequencing costs are dramatically decreasing. Um, with new instruments coming online every day, the cost per base is pretty cheap. I wish I could say that computational costs are decreasing just as rapidly, but they're still pretty substantial. And quick turnaround, this is really important, and it's hard to turn around genomics data. Genomics data, by definition, is big data. It's unstructured. It comes off of the instruments unstructured. You have to really process this data heavily in order to actually turn it into something that's meaningful. So I'm going to focus on one of the populations that we've been trying to help significantly in the state of Delaware. Um, they are at a high risk, which is the Dover um, Amish population, which was founded in 1915. It's located in southern Dover. Um, its estimated population is about 3,200 with over 400 plus families. Unfortunately, um, uh, in the early 1900s, the anti-Baptists, a lot of them did not survive the, the travel over here, and they um, suffered from what's called a bottleneck effect or the founder effect. Um, so you have limited genomic diversity, and over time, things that are rare become enriched. Um, this community has been medically under, underrepresented and underserved, um, and because they had this founder population, they, their distribution of pathogenetic variants um, are very unique to this um, population and very different from other po um, populations within the state of Delaware. And we really needed to come up with a cost-effective method for helping this community. 
So in 2019, we developed what's called now the Plain Insight Panel, or the PIP. We published this in the Journal of Molecular Diagnostics. And the focus of this was really to come up with a cost-effective genomic sequencing platform that was able to focus on 202 genomic regions across 162 different syndromes, um, and we looked at 168 different genes. Um, this initial, initial study as a proof of concept, we had 63 participants, and from 63 participants, we found 273 rare SNPs and small indels, 35 copy number variations, and one chromosomal abnormality. If we look at the histogram or the distribution on the left-hand side of these rare variants, we see a normal distribution. This is not what one would expect. This is due to that founder effect where you have a significant enrichment of these rare alleles. This particular project, computationally, the challenge was to be able to precisely identify these genomic lesions, associate them appropriately with a gene, and then ultimately with a disease and, and the actionable um, uh, steps that a clinician could take at the bedside. And here's just a summary of some of those findings. So from here, we scaled this to focus on the Dover population. And so far, we've screened well over 200 participants. Today, I'm only going to show um, the first uh, pilot. And from here, we found of 200 and one participant, three had personally actionable results. That means that by identifying this single variant or allele, returning that back to the patient and a provider, clinically actionable actions could be taken present day to help those particular individuals. We had 84 participants that had personally actionable um, variants, however, they were carrier status, meaning that they only carried one copy of the rare allele versus both, so there was really nothing that we could do at the bedside for them, but it's important for family planning. 74 were carriers of recessive conditions. We had 22 um, subjects, which were 11 couples, that were identified as high risk, and I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail, and we only had 18 um, participants which had no findings um, from this study. So if we look at the high-risk couples, um, unfortunately we identified multiple high-risk families, and of those you can see here the number of deceased children in those families. So unfortunately these kids present as medically complex um, pretty early in life, oftentimes immediately in the NIC or the PIC unit. And these families and the clinicians need a rapid genomics test that's able to improve the outcomes. And this is much different than predictive medicine, right? This is just being able to find a variant, an allele, associate it with a condition, and associate it with something that's medically actionable. This is really important, and I think sometimes is overlooked because everybody's looking to the future, which is predictive medicine, which is going to be my next case study and the complications associated with that. These high-risk families need something that's affordable, and again, as sequencing costs continue to decrease, we're not really seeing a dramatic decrease in the computational costs that are associated with doing these types of analysis. And clinicians need data that's actionable. That's one of the biggest things that I've learned working in a hospital setting, and although I do love predictive modeling and I'm excited to show the next presentation, Clinicians have a hard time with predictions. What do you do with them? How do you use them? This type of genomics data, it's very, um, in some sense, um, more clean, it's more crisp, it's easy to understand it, and it's actually easier to apply it at the bedside. The second case study I'm going to talk about is pediatric acute leukemia, or AML. Unfortunately, there still is a really poor outcome for children who have AML. Um, there's a variability in response to treatment. With less than a 70% survival rate, um, for children who have AML. It's very different genomically um, per children and also different compared to adults. And this is something else that we've learned over the years is that oftentimes we like to apply what's in adults to children and that's just not appropriate. We have to have equity um, in terms of these types of things and that applies to children as well. Children are different than adults and they need to be studied differently than adults. Um, this is some fantastic work done by Foundation Medicine, the Children's Oncology Group, and many oncologists, where we're able to show here that over time, so you have age of diagnosis on your x-axis, and then the type of fusion, so your fusion prevalence is on the left, versus the single nucleotide variants on your right, and we see a nice relationship between age of diagnosis. So children have a very different genetic landscape um, based on their AML than adults do, and we still have to actually treat children the same way that we treat adults, even though they have a different um, reason for having pediatric AML. So I've been fortunate enough to work with the Children's Oncology Group, um, specifically on AML 1031, which is a clinical trial. Um, we have 926 children who were diagnosed with um, pediatric AML, and we've been able to do sequencing or genomics um, at time of diagnosis, remission, and relapse. 
Um, the graph in the middle is actually a Kaplan-Meier curve where you're looking at survival probability, and I've broken it up here based on residual disease. So the red line represents children who had residual disease still present um, during the remission state, and the blue line are children that did not. And you can clearly see a significant difference between outcome, whether or not you have residual disease still present um, at time of remission. So for this particular project, we wanted to know if we could predict outcome based on the transcript transcriptomic profile a time of diagnosis for, for pediatric AML. So really just asking the question, a time of diagnosis, can we predict what your outcome is going to be? Can we predict whether you're going to respond to a treatment and be able to clear this? We have run over hundreds of thousands of models, so the computational infrastructure needed for this particular project is much more significant than the first project. And we've had to leverage high performance clusters, GPU systems, and all sorts of wonderful techniques to be able to run this. We have divided the subjects into multiple different training and test sets. We've tested multiple feature selection techniques and tested numerous classifiers, everything from random forest, gradient boosting to SVMs. We plot the ROC curve to determine the best performing. And this is just one example on the right of one of the best models that we've been able to develop. And I have to say we were really excited about this ROC curve and I could not wait to show my clinical collaborators that at time of diagnosis we are able to, with an 83% um, area under the curve, predict who is going to respond or not respond. And this is work done by a brilliant grad student in my lab, Mauricio Ferrato. We then took the features that were selected through the Shapley technique. We're actually using um, machine learning techniques that have been traditionally applied for social media, and we're actually now using them for genomics, including Shapley values. And we could see really from the beginning at time of diagnosis that a signature for chemotherapy resistance before you even get chemotherapy was present. Again, we're very excited about these results. However, when we showed them to the clinicians, um, it's hard to use this data at the bedside. It's not very actionable. So we know you may not respond, but this is the only treatment out there. What are we going to do? What does it mean that you have an 83% response rate? Oftentimes I like to use the example of, I have 30% chance of tripping on the sidewalk today. So do I not walk on the sidewalk? Do I wrap myself in bubble wrap? How do I use this information at the bedside to improve patient care? And I think for us, that's one place that we've seen where machine learning, um, AI um, is, is still a really big struggle. And how do you apply these predictions? How do you pro apply these probabilities at the bedside, especially when there may not be a lot of options moving forward in terms of different treatments? Um, this really does take advanced data, advanced data analytic, analytics and bioinformatic pipelines. Um, predictive data is very difficult to use at the bedside, especially this type of information. And the turnaround time for precision medicine is very, it's a very interesting concept, right? Precision medicine, personalized medicine, it's all about an N of one. I can tell you, you cannot run these types of classifiers, though, without a population level data, right? So we heard from the previous speakers the importance of these sort of publicly available data sets, being able to use population level data in order to really deliver precision medicine because statistically an N of 1 means absolutely nothing if it's not in context with population level data. So our summary or for our model for clinical utility is really there needs to be a strong clinical need. If there is no strong clinical need, I do work at a PJAC hospital, it's not something that our genomics team is going to focus on. There has to be a strong foundation for research. Without the strong foundation of research and understanding these population level trends, it's very hard to deliver an N of 1 or precision medicine for genomics. We use this to drive forward our diagnostic and our genomics laboratories, and bioinformatics um, high performance clusters are really key in driving this um, life cycle. It's really the fuel for the engine for turning these gears together. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the um, wonderful group of people that have come together on this work, and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, David, are you all set? Yeah. All right. Give me one second here. I think you want to see the other screen, right? One second. How does that look? We're good. Okay, great. So, a real pleasure to be here and to add to this conversation. Uh, my name is uh, David Jaffrey. I'm a physicist. I trained in uh, medical physics and 
have worked in the field in developing uh, new technologies to advance uh, treatments in cancer and worked in the computing space for, I don't know, it seems like a long time now, maybe 30 years. Uh, yes, I did play with PDP-11 systems a long time ago, um, but now I'm, I'm much more in the space of trying to understand how we can do more with computing and actually change the way we work. It's really, I think, a, a huge opportunity moving forward. And so my talk today is about uh, the more the compute, the greater the focus on the data. And I'm seeing a, a remarkable amount of pressure and trend. I'm the Chief Technology and Digital Officer at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and I oversee the IT teams, the cybersecurity, and our new initiative on, on data science and oncology. So I'm just going to share some perspectives with you and hope you, hopefully stimulate some conversation. Uh, um, first of all, in the context of cancer, the amount of information associated with the process of care is absolutely exploding. Um, it's remarkable. We use imaging data. We use tissue-derived measures. We're now using circulating markers in an effort to understand the disease and classify so we can predict how a patient will come out if treated in a certain way. And now with interventional procedures that are marching through time, whether it's bloodborne cancers or in the context of a regular therapy process, we're now sampling and putting imaging data through the course of time. So we're actually making smaller and smaller cohorts of patients, which we have to try to figure out how that intervention proceeds. And at the end of the day, we're not doing very well at the outcomes collection in general. So it's a real challenge. Um, and at the end of the, at, at the start of the day, what we want to do is tell that patient, given that N of one and a bunch of N of N data, put that together with a tumor, the patient environment and predict an outcome. It's called conditional prognosis. We'd love to be able to do that as a previous speaker, the speaker mentioned. But um, this is becoming overwhelming. Uh, Post-its will not do this anymore. Uh, we need to think differently. And electronic medical records, which were mostly designed to, to address uh, poor handwriting and searching for documents, won't satisfy this problem either. Uh, we need to adopt machine-based approaches. I always like to go back in time. This is a little bit far back, and I doubt if Hippocrates said it exactly this way, but medicine has always been personalized. And this is a, this is a translation from Hipp Hippocratic thinking. It is that it is the best thing, in my opinion, for the physician to apply himself diligently to the art of foreknowing. Well, back when you had a few things to look at, you could be diligent. Now, the amount of information in making medical decisions is overwhelming. Uh, this is a great uh, figure from Abernathy's papers a couple years ago, just talking about the facts per decision in medicine. Human cognitive capacity sits at around five. That's why when you go to buy a car, it's usually the color type of the car, do you want leather, um, how many doors? After that, it gets blurry. Um, so uh, about five things for you feeding to decisions. And cancer is really interesting because in this background, we have a whole bunch of new tests and features that are coming forward that could potentially contribute to progress. We have rapid technology associated changes because they don't make the same machines to treat the patients. They don't use the same practices today as they did two, five, 10 years ago. Because of uh, and lack of stationary in the processes that were characterized. Plus, in the context of cancer, there's a variability in presentation and the history of prior cycles of diagnosis intervention really make it hard to understand what the patient's state is, and of course, new combination therapy. So we need a new, a new approach, actually. I don't see us making progress with the current approach. Um, uh, there's a lot of hope that a learning machine could help. Um, I love this phrase, everybody talks about machine learning, but learning machines we're talking about, and, and it's a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. This is a quote from Arthur Samuel back in 1959, very promising, and I don't think I have to tell this audience about these things. But what I really started to really understand, um, having programmed a lot of if-then structures in an adventure game back in the late 80s, you can't go very far uh, with if then, if then, if then. And in many ways, the neural net development is a massive set of continuous if thens that program themselves by showing them examples. And machines program themselves. And they program themselves uh, from data. Here's a fellow, which you ever get a chance to talk to, Jeff Hinton. He uh, published this paper back in 1986, which is basically the essence of back projecting errors in neural nets. He get, he's a, his background is in neuroscience. Uh, he's a, I think he's a great friend, nephew or something of Google. Very interesting guy. I really like talking to Jeff. But this idea that can computers mimic uh, humans uh, really relates to the concept that we can show them something, 
repetitively, they can build up the patterns, effectively develop the if-then structures in the form of the nets, not exactly if-then, but you get the idea. And we can have these machines learn much more quickly uh, and respond and mimic what we want uh, remarkably well. It's very exciting, it's a very hot topic. AI, this is what makes everybody excited about AI, although there's a lot of other parts. And people have used it in the context of medicine for things like classifying um, cancer uh, in the context of skin cancer. So this is stimulating, great stuff back in, uh, from Stanford back in 2017, not in clinical use at this point in time, Interesting, why not? Uh, I really wonder about that. What, what is not making these things stick, um, even though they're extremely compelling and exciting? We have other contexts that are very interesting, much more elaborate situations in cancer. I happen to know a little bit about this one because the work was done in Toronto when I was there. We're actually showing CT scans to the machine learning algorithms, and they are guessing what the dose distribution should be for the space on the CT scan itself. And uh, the uh, a few other parameters describing the nature of disease and the type of patient, et cetera, actually guessing the pattern of the dose. Remarkably, it's possible to be competitive with experts that have been planning radiation doses for years. And these two examples, I, I, the point I want to make, and I'm not going to go into gory detail, is that it's the data that's programming the machines. It's hardly even humans coding the machines. The data is what's coding the machines. And uh, the field of data science is very exciting because the way I think of this is that this is a new world where machines are learning. And who coaches the machines? How do they learn? And in many ways, the data science field is really about uh, coaching the machines in terms of learning. And if you ever get a chance to read about Jim Gray, he, he talks about the fourth paradigm of science. There's empirical, there's theoretical, there's computational, and there's now what he refers to as data-driven. Jim passed away, unfortunately, in a sailing accident but uh, it had a really great perspective on this. And you know, empirical, as in we watch the stars, theoretical, maybe that retrograde motion is because of gravitational field. Uh, computational, we can now predict uh, what we should see based on complex computational approaches. And then data-driven, where there's just so much data, the cost of measurement has fallen so much um, that it, we actually are responsive to the, to the yield of data from systems. I think it's a very interesting paradigm. So, but data scientists are only part of the story. I, I'm very interested in the topic of the flow of data. This is what I've become a little bit obsessed with this. Um, if it comes across the next few slides, then we'll have lots to talk about. Uh, in many ways, data is the new code. If the machines are learning, uh, data is the new code. We know that bad code can produce bad results, just like we know that the in, use of inappropriate data can inappropriate results. So how do we reteach the world to program, so to say? And the development of machine learning technologies have accelerated the growth and demand for data and highlighted the vulnerability to quality. And now that machines are learning directly from the data, effectively being coded by the data, um, it's becoming very, very important that the quality is understood. So organizations that invest in their internal data supply chains will be the best partners for the stakeholders moving forward. And we really embrace this uh, at MD Anderson as a paradigm. If we're all coding, how do we get credit for our contribution? How do we have confidence in the code slash data? How do we have new releases of code? Is it because the data is changing? It's not stable? Does it have stationarity? And then if we have those algorithms that were developed by the data, um, how do we know we can continue to apply them? Should they be continue to be applied? Is the data that they're being uh, used to drive them still stable? And this paradigm of managing these aspects and understanding the provenance of the data is, is critical from a regulatory perspective. And my last point that I really want to make after some of this is that this stronger data supply chains will lead to accelerated advances in mechanism-based computing. So I'm really going to Marty on this one. I really like your comments about this, but if you make strong data supply chains, if you invest in the quality of the data from measurement through stewardship to insight extraction, these supply chains connect insight back to the source data. And this drives more engagement, understanding of the process and nuance of measurement. And ultimately, I believe it guides us on to what measures to measure next. So you'd ask, how is this related to bioinformatics? Well, I think bioinformatics got really got started being, being close to the genomics. They, they were close to the measurement and trying to extract. Similarly, the systems biologists, they love to be there with the measurement and the analysis. But that data supply chain can't just be restricted to just a few cells 
we need to think about that data supply chain that stretches across the entire field of medicine and the fabric to allow us to govern that data, track the provenance, assure the quality of the data, that creates a really powerful feedback loop. And I think AI and ML will completely focus the field and the world on managing our data better. And that will automatically make better algorithms, more accurate systems, and we'll know whether we can apply them or bust them. I won't go through this summary because it says the thing I just said. And I'll stop there so we have more time to talk. Thanks for your attention. All right, thank you, David. And uh, let's give a hand to all of our panelists. They did a fantastic job. All right. So at this point, we're kind of moving into a Q&A aspect of the, of the panel. Uh, just to remind everyone again that the uh, Slido is where we can actually ask some questions, make sure they get echoed and so forth, and, and from that perspective. Uh, we do have a couple that have already come in. Uh, one of the questions that comes in, and this always comes, comes through uh, in, in these types of topics, but can you elaborate more about the workforce that we need, AI, ML, and bioinformatics? I think we all realize the dependence that we have on that. So I know, Sean, you, you mentioned some of that in yours, so if you'd pick that uh, first, and then we can react with the others as well. Um, that's a great question, and I don't have a perfect answer uh, because I, I, I think that, uh, as I think everybody has kind of said, uh, this is um, uh, not a question of an application or a, a, a specific problem to solve. This is really, we're seeing um, it right in front of our eyes uh, the way that we're going to, um, a change in the way that we think about how we approach problems, not just in the biomedical sphere, but, uh, but elsewhere. Um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, take somebody else's ideas here. There's, there's a, a program um, that just uh, came out with RFAs and people have um, uh, applied at this point called the Bridge, uh, Bridge to Artificial Intelligence, Bridge to AI program. Um, it's an NIH funded program to develop uh, uh, data sets and data resources that are um, uh, fair, fit, uh, uh, and ethical. Uh, for um, developing um, AI approaches um, as a test bed and also um, to develop um, uh, capabilities around being able to do this. And the really interesting thing about this, this, um, this, this uh, RFA is that it includes not just the technical pieces. Um, they, so they structured the, the um, RFA as a set of modules. And included in those modules are an ethics module, um, a teaming module, an education outreach and workforce development module, in addition to the the usual, um, you know, uh, data standards, and and I think that we should begin to think about um, artificial intelligence and its application um, as including not just lip service to uh, um, to ethics, workforce development training, um, uh, and teaming, uh, but really um, have experts in the room who think about how teams work, uh, how communication doesn't how communication breaks down, um, how we lose track of uh, intellectual property, things like that, and make sure that as we move forward uh, with this, uh, that, that we're thinking about all of those things. So it's not just about developing a workforce, it's about changing the way we think about who's going to be in the room um, as we work through these problems. Fantastic. I, I guess I'd like to add, if you don't mind, back to the workforce development. I think. Uh, I think what we really need is people who are at the intersection of, uh, you know, obviously it's all team science, right, from here on in. So we need computer scientists, we need domain scientists, we need teaming people and everything else Sean was talking about, um, experts in all those areas. But I think, you know, it's the being able to apply all the computational thinking to solving these kinds of problems. So we need people who are at the, who can work at the intersection and you know, each of these different domains, we all have our own specific language that we use. And so it's bridging across disciplines, trying to you know, impedance match between all the different disciplines. It's just, uh, so we need folks, you know, we need uh, you know, biologic, basic, uh, biologically science, biological science trained folks who can have some computational thinking and can help talk to the computer scientists. We need computer scientists and data scientists. It's, it's not a specific language, I think, uh, one of the other folks here said that it's more being able to 
uh, speak the different languages and abstract away some of the concepts. I think that's what we really need. So anyway. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, I'd love to top, uh, comment. And we're, we're also we're seeing a huge, um, with the work from home paradigm, a huge loss of uh, computational scientists from the academic domains and um, the ability to go and work from anywhere. Uh, industry is really pulling a lot of people out of the organizations. So one of the things that uh, we're realizing is we need to put a concentrated effort into building the environment for data scientists, whether it's uh, improving access to the data so they get to focus on what they like doing, give them a great mission, make sure they're compensated effectively. Uh, this is a big issue. Um, and so that's one aspect. I just want to pick up on Patricia's point earlier also, the, the cultural side uh, is a team sport more and more. The data and the, and the sharing of data, the collaborating around data, it, it, we're really, really keen on finding people who aren't don't want a lone wolf approaches. They, they really feel that a, a rising tide lifts all boat and boats. And that's my, the governance paradigm I think around data is, is a positive thing. Actually, I believe that with more governance, we'll have more data because people will be more clear what's gonna be used for. But you gotta get people thinking that kind of systems thinking approach. And uh, yeah, so that that is, a, it's, a, it's, it's a challenge from a cultural perspective because we're not built academically to, to, to work that way. On some about promotions and so on and so forth. So that tension is going to go for a long time into the future. All right. Thank you. Uh, pick another question that we have uh, from the from the attendees. What are the obstacles moving forward in providing confidence of the results to patients and their health that that do have low or no understanding of HPC, AI, or data. So as we're working with patients that just don't really understand the things that we're trying to develop the workforce for, how do we move ahead and give that confidence when they don't have a context? I think this gets uh, more to David and perhaps to Aaron and to answer. I'm happy to jump on that one. Uh, trust uh, is a very important thing in healthcare. Uh, people trust us with their lives. Um, uh, they have to trust us with our data, uh, but I mean, uh, there's the old trust but verify. We're thinking that as an institution, we need to put together uh, model management activities that are really rigorous. Um, we're going to be using these algorithms, and, and CMS is going to come and talk to us and say, show, me, show us the data. We can't say that person made a mistake because they're human. Instead, we have this algorithm that we're using. And it did make some mistakes. They're going to say, well, show us the data you used to commission that algorithm. Show us the evidence that the data that's flowing into the use that algorithm is stable as it was when you commissioned it. Um, and uh, the regulator is going to want to see that too. So we need to build, I think Patricia mentioned this uh, also, build up that internal muscle to manage these algorithms um, and, and to have manage that whole life cycle. That, that is a and we need to be able to defend it, not for the patients for sure, from a trust point of view, but I mean, also, I think the regulators are gonna to wanna to see it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, how are we validating it? What's the nutrition label? I kind of like the nutrition label idea. Um, but I think, and I talked to uh, Sean Hanlon, who was part of the workshop on Monday at NCI about this, but I mean, because I almost feel like there should be a national framework so that all of us can kind of help uh, some national standards to help figure out how to plug into it. I mean, obviously, if stuff is being used for clinical care, then FDA and everybody else needs to be involved. But even just getting basic steps and research is trying to sort that out, too, is tricky. And um, yeah, and like I said, you, you know, internally, we can maybe figure out some of the bias. But I mean, when we're using a, a, you know, AI algorithms from other places, how do we know? You know, it'd be nice to have some scorecard or something to help uh, to really help judge things. How was it validated? How, you know, wh how large was the training size? What exactly was included in it? I mean, can we come up with a standard framework or a list of questions that we could ask all of these things we want to deploy and kind of assess? You know, I, I mean, this is like a lot of the data warehouse stuff that we have with our data. You know, every time I give out data, I want to say, here's the error bars on all this data, right? Here's how accurate we kind of think this is, right? And it's um, tricky. The only thing I, would... I, I just to add on to that, I would say that I think also another big challenge is, is that data sets that are generated in, you know, biological sciences, right, are not generated to be AI ready, right? They're generated 
for many multitudes of different types of analyses downstream. And so I think what would be fantastic is if we had the ability as a community, right, to come together and to say, okay, here are some guidelines that you can use to make your data sets AI ready so that when you're using them in your algorithms and then you're sharing them for other people to use them, we all know with confidence that, that the same guardrails have been put on. And I guess you could say the same type of thing for the algorithmic development. Um, but I, I think as more and more data just keeps pouring out of everywhere, it's gonna be so important for us to have some guardrails on how to make these data sets AI ready and, and reproducible. Erin. And I think, you know, of course, it's really tricky with the HR data that's mixed uh, of questionable data quality. Oh, sorry. Erin, why don't you go? Oh, that's really cool. Not, Analog, virtual, real combo. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. Uh, the only thing I would I would add to is training of clinicians, nurses. Um, in medical school, you don't learn how to talk about AI or machine learning to your patients. It's not the data scientists that are at the bedside. I'm a PhD. I don't interact with patients. It's the MDs. It's the nurse practitioners. It's That's where the trust comes, right? The trust between a patient is with their provider. And providers need to know how to talk to their patients about this type of information. And you don't really learn about machine learning in medical school. You don't learn about predictions and how to talk to your patient about these types of things. And I think that's missing from the education um, with, our, with our clinical um, system here. And, and the only thought that I'll follow up with on, on that, Erin, is my sister is, a, is an OBGYN nurse. And when I say to her things like, ooh, which antibiotic did you give them? Because that works better for this than that because of this other thing. Her response is, Marty, I don't need to know that to take care of my patient. I need to know what's the right thing to do for my patient. So one of the questions that's interesting to me is how do you translate all of the complexity that goes into this into something that a nurse can use to make a decision and communicate to a patient. That's going to be really tough. And I'm, while I'm talking, I'd love to grab a minute just to say, David, I was intrigued by your idea of data being the thing that's coding the outcome. I think that what that means Jill, coming back to your recent comment, is that we need to think up front about what is the data we want to be learning. What data needs, that's part of the ethical decision, I think. What are the, what's the question we want to ask and therefore what data needs to be out there coding things? And yeah, so do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, uh, we'll go, uh, Jill, go ahead. I'll, I'll... I was just going to say, Marty, to your first point, so my husband is, is a physician and he carries around these note cards, as you many physicians I know, where they're writing down ideas on those note cards and they have them in their pocket and the note cards are like magical. They cannot lose those note cards, right? And I think that it's not, I think it would be so cool, right, to, to be able to sit down and have more of those discussions between the computationally minded folks and the folks who are like, boots on the ground, front line, you know, taking care of patients to say, we just want to hear from you. What's on your note cards? What's your hunch, right? What, what hunches do you have? And they all talk about lots of anecdotes. You know, you know, I saw two patients in the last month who had this and that and this and that, and they seem to maybe be outliers, but I'm just not really sure. You know, I've looked in the literature and there's nothing. So many times these hunches turn into major discoveries. So I think it's also, I would say the onus is somewhat on us as well to, you know, search out and, and, and ask around for how can I start to form these collaborations, ask for help to meet people um, and have these conversations with them. That's a great point. Uh, I, in general, I think we think the world is 
very uniform when it's packed. It's very variable. Um, a great example was on Epic Sepsis um, algorithm, which was tested in tens of thousands of patients, and then they moved to a different system and applied it, and the AUC dropped by like 10% or something. I mean, just because of different jurisdictions, and, and the metadata that's, that's, that's describing the difference of the practice of medicine in those populations just made the algorithm no longer applicable. And I, I find that, that to me, it means that we always will have to localize the algorithm the data, which means that's work for the hospitals to do it. Um, it could be some priors. We can leverage some priors and some pre pre programming effectively of the nets to do that, I think. But still, there will always be this localization. And so I, I find that very intriguing. That's why we've kind of concluded that we need to put together a team of model managers at MD Anderson, that their job is to just take the algorithms verify that they are, can be applied and then manage them like a stable of robotic resources that are operating and making sure they're performing. It's, it's a very interesting problem. I didn't see it coming, but it's here. I'll say that was our experience. I mean, we have different eight different hospitals throughout New York City. And if we and, and different populations, whether you're in Queens or the Lower East Side or wherever you are, and that was exactly our experience that the, we have to retrain the models on the specific populations that are there because, like you said, the, the AUC drops. So it's very interesting. All right. I would say just before we get off this topic, you know, I, I want to put a plug in for diversity and inclusion, um, making sure that we're thinking about that as we're thinking about developing our workforce, thinking about how our algorithms work and validate, um, you know, that some of that sepsis algorithm problem, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm sure we've all seen the, the headlines about the, um, is it the kidney failure algorithm? Is that right? Um, so, you know, I think we have to be cognizant of that because there's no perfect data and there's no perfect algorithm, right? There are biases everywhere. Um, and Patricia, maybe that's to your point, like that's why it makes sense to have everybody in the room talking because you want to hear about, hey, this is where all these potential biases can come in and um, deal with them the best you can, right? No algorithm is going to be able to handle all of them, but maybe you can handle most of them. Great. All right, we are actually approaching time, and I want to make sure everyone gets at least one last comment. So I'm, I'm actually going to go around the room, or not around the room, around the, uh, around the horn, and give you all about 30 seconds to leave one last comment you would share with this community. I know we could keep going for hours with this, uh, but, but uh, we'll go with that. And I'm going to go over to my left and go in the room and ask Erin to, to give us the one last comment that she would want to share with this community. Yeah, so thank you so much for the opportunity. I think um, it's a really exciting time and we have a lot of work cut out for us. I agree with the comments about um, um, equity and so forth, and it's really hard to apply these types of things in rural hospitals and rural communities as well. Um, and we have a lot of work ahead of us to be able to do that, and I think it's important. Um, so this is my last comment, I guess. Thank you, Erin. Jill. I just want to say data, data, data. Um, share it, reuse it, make it accessible. Um, make sure you document everything. Awesome. Patricia. I will agree with everyone who, all the panelists before me, and I see this question here about provenance, which is, of course, extremely important and will help with all this. And uh, yeah, we have plenty of work to do, exciting future ahead, and um, yeah, thanks for coming. All right. Sean. Um, it's been great uh, and really enjoyed all the comments. I wanted to just come back to this uh, clinical um, question. I think that um, you know we're we're talking to with a group of pe people who are in very mature organizations, and I think as we go forward, one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that we're managing expectations, um, especially in the research community, where there is a, a real sense that uh, I can take my my model and apply it in a clinical context, and uh, that just takes an, an enormous amount of work and strategy, strategic planning, um, and then implementation. 
David may have uh, some comments about that as well, but uh, it, it's worth thinking now about what the world's going to look like in five to 10 years. All right, David. Uh, I was going to say something, but then since Sean called me out, uh, uh, the, uh, I completely agree. I, I think I see the algorithm as a commodity. It's the data supply side and the uh, deployment side is really the hard work to be done. There's so much algorithm, um, so dependent on data, and the Aaron's comment she made earlier, so important to make out relevant to action. And, and the support to make that happen is what we're focusing on. We wanna have more data science around us, but without it, it bounces off the organization. We need to have that execution part. Um, and it's a cultural shift to realize that, that it's not a nature paper. It's actually helping people make decisions and, and stuff like that. So nature papers are okay. Nothing wrong with that. Just to be clear about that. All right. And, and Marty. So I'm going to just uh, make explicit the mindset and the um, focus that I'm hearing from each of the people in this virtual room today, which is I was a chemist. I sat next to organic chemists for a long time who would run reactions and end up with sticky black tar in the bottom of their test tubes. And as a computational scientist, I have never had that problem. I always get an answer out of my calculation. But what I think that means and what I'm hearing all of you say is that that calls us as computational scientists to a higher level of rigor a higher level of integrity and a higher level of ethical practice in how we carry out our calculations and how we communicate about those results to all of the impacted people. And I think that's what all of us were saying, but I just wanted to call that out explicitly as a responsibility that we have on our short shoulders. All right, thank you, Marty. Uh, as, we, as we wrap up this panel, I want to steal a line from Patricia. <clears throat> we are also hiring at Frederick National Lab for Cancer Research. So if you know of any good bioinformatics analysts, data scientists, or computational scientists, let us know. Uh, we have opportunities there. But I also want to say thank you to our panelists for a fantastic panel, great presentations. The diversity of perspective was tremendous. I hope you all got something that you could connect with and something that you can take away and then move forward with. You can hear that message of community, data, integrity, uh, diversity, all pervasive through everything that we do. And we hope that you take that and do something with it. So with that, I'd appreciate if we give our panelists a round of applause. And thank you, panelists, for your time this afternoon. It's been great.